I'm delighted to welcome you all to Travel My Libraries event by Dublin City Council Historian in Residence for Dublin Central, Dr Mary Muldowney, and historian Catherine Holmes. The presentation is called Devastation in the North Strand, the bombing of the North Strand on the night of the 30th and 31st of May 1941. Travel Mall Library is located just off the North Strand, yards from where the largest bomb fell. Though the building was fortunate to remain largely undamaged. Indeed, the basement of the library provided shelter for many families that night, and the library was used as an operational headquarters and housing office for some time afterwards. Tonight's event is organised by Dublin City Libraries as part of our response to the 80th anniversary of that tragic night. And now I'm very pleased to hand you over to Mary Muldowney. Good evening and welcome to this Zoom talk hosted, as Anne just said, by Charleville Mall Library. Not only was Charleville Mall Library just beside the scene of the worst and heaviest bomb in, 19, in May 1941, but afterwards it became the headquarters for organising the recovery operations by Dublin Corporation. Now, my name is Mary Muldowney and I'm the Dublin City Council Historian in Residence for Dublin Central. And I will be covering the background to the horrific events of the night of 30th stroke, 31st of May 1941, and some of the measures that were taken in the aftermath. I'm also very pleased to be joined this evening by Catherine Holmes, who will introduce you to some of the personal stories uh, that were collected by the Dublin City Council Oral History Project, which now features in an updated online exhibition, which you can view at www.northstrandbombing.ie, uh, with lots of uh, additional information and including a new uh, video video just five and a quarter minutes long so it won't take too much out of your day to watch it but it's really good. Anyway to go back to 1939. At that stage the Irish government's decision to keep air in neutral in the Second World War was widely supported in this country not least because many people still saw Britain as the main enemy that had needed to be forced from Irish shores. As Colonel Donald O'Carroll explains so clearly in the lecture that you can listen to on the new website under this tab here, uh, throughout the 1930s, various submissions were made by the army general staff uh, for an army organization that would reasonably be capable of defending the country from outside attack, particularly from Britain. There'd been a certain preoccupation since the uh, Civil War with internal attack and uh, the remnants of the anti-treaty troops. But by this stage, it was beginning to recognise they're in far more danger from outside the country. In 1936, the Director of Intelligence forecasts that war was likely to break out in Europe in 38 or 39, and the defence forces should rearm in line with other European states. The Irish Army was expanded to several times its pre-war size, with large numbers joining in 1940 and 41, when invasion seemed a strong possibility. By early 1942, there were nearly 40,000 men creating two divisions. A local security force was formed on 24th of May 1940 after the invasion of France, under guard control at that stage. In January 1941, most of that force was transferred to army control to become the local defence force, whose membership peaked at 100,000 in 1942. And here you can see their uniform, which is probably much more like an army uniform than a guard one. So uh, in January, uh, as I said, they were transferred, but the Department of Defence also created a coast watch service, 
uh, which you can see here, one of the motor torpedo boats that they bought to patrol the coastal areas by land and sea for signs of invasion. And in this picture, taken in the early stages of the emergency, members of the Irish Army, Urquhart, you can see wearing the German style helmet, which was later replaced because they were getting such a hard time, uh, particularly from British newspapers, about the design. So the more British approach was uh, adopted. In any case, when the Irish government responded to British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's declaration of war on Germany on the 3rd of September 1939, it was with the passing of the Emergency Powers Act. <coughs> Excuse me. Ireland's independence at that stage was just 17 years old. Its constitution was only two years old and its control of the strategic ports barely a year out from uh, British control. So the emergency, and the name was derived from the Emergency Powers Act, um, necessitated preparing to protect Terra from potential, potential invasion by British or German forces, using practical measures to measure to secure the government and the population. In the summer of 1939, the Irish government was conscious that threats to urban areas could be a possibility for Dublin, regardless of its being the capital of a neutral state. The development of aerial warfare, which had been in its infancy in 1918 when the First World War ended, meant that cities would now be much more vulnerable to attack than had been the case when warfare was largely concentrated on the ground or at sea. You can see here that during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939, unrestricted bombing of towns and cities from the air was first used on a large scale. And some of the images here from uh, Guernica, the Basque city that was almost levelled by the German Nazi Condor Legion and the Italian uh, fascist Avazione er, Legionaria, forgive my awful pronunciation, uh, this Guernica was uh, destroyed in 1937 and a British study written a year later demonstrated that the combined tactics of silent approach and high explosive bombing, both of which were used experimentally by the Germans and the Italians over uh, Spain, were seen as particularly effective in inducing a negative psychological effect in the population of a large city, and really understandably so. So, we still don't know for certain if the bombing of Dublin in the early hours of 31st of May 1941 was accidental or deliberate. However, we certainly recognise that the impact was absolutely devastating for the residents of the area who survived that terrible night. Many Dublin citizens who didn't live in the North Strand, Summerhill, Ballybock area could see the light from the fires from quite a distance and it left indelible marks on their memories too. The sense of security that neutrality was supposed to engender in era was undermined for many Dubliners by the city's lack of protection against attack from the skies. On the 2nd of September, Article 28 of Bunrathnaheran had been amended by the First Amendment of the Constitution Act 1939, and this was to include a state of emergency in the provisions for wartime governance. Having allowed for the concept of an emergency, um, which would have a similar impact on the state as if the country was actually at war, or not neutral at least. On 3rd of September, the uh, Oireachtas passed the Emergency Powers Act, as I said, to make provision for securing the public safety and the preservation of the state in time of war, and in particular, to make provision for the maintenance of public order and for the provision and control of supplies and services essential to the life of the community. 
This was the most wide ranging of the wartime laws in that it was used as the basis for the control of virtually every aspect of civilian life during the emergency period. It went from food rationing to transport regulation to wage rises and many other issues in between. Eamon de Valera was both Taoiseach and Minister for External Affairs and he appointed Frank Aiken to be Minister Without Portfolio or the Minister for Coordinating Defensive Measures. Aiken used the Emergency Powers Act extensively until he stood down from that position at the end of the emergency in 1945. But in the early years of the war particularly, there was a distinct lack of clarity about what should be done, um, as I said, to maintain public order. So until 1941, Era had no food rationing system and the rising prices meant that poverty and malnutrition were widespread with ch children suffering most. Following intense lobbying by such groups as the Irish Women Workers Union, the Irish Housewives Association and various senior clerical and political figures, the Department of Supplies was set up in mid-1941 with Sean Mass as its head. Immediately sugar, tea and fuel were rationed and various other um, products and foodstuffs etc were followed suit in the years afterwards. Now while the North Strand, Summerhill and Ballybock area in 1941 have been described as an urban village, this suggests a place that was uniformly comfortable, uh, but it also contains some of the most overcrowded housing in the city, so it's not really an accurate description. You can see in the high percentage of uh, dwellings with whole families living in one or two rooms in the city as a whole, which is highlighted in yellow and throughout the wards that I've chosen there. Um, Adequate housing was a particular problem for some residents of Ballybock, uh, Summerhill and North Dock, uh, Manjoy, sorry, in the North City and North Dock wards. I've left in Clontarf East as a comparator here as being the nearest ward to um, North Strand, but obviously it didn't suffer from the same disadvantages. The hardships experienced by families with low incomes as the rationing system got bedded in would have been experienced by many of the people in the north inner city area. There were still heavily tenanted uh, tenements in Clarence Street North, for example, where a huge amount of damage was done. In addition to bombing, one of the fears connected to danger from above was the possibility of gas attacks. This resulted from the use of gas in the trenches during the First World War. There were survivors of those attacks living in many areas of Dublin, with their poor health offering tangible evidence of the destructiveness of poison gas. Plans were made in 1940 and 41 for the evacuation of Dublin in the event of invasion although it was only intended to move the cabinet and key figures in the government um, to the Midlands mainly were the intentions, but not for the majority of citizens, including children. In the course of 1940, gas masks were uh, issued to 370,000 people throughout the 26 counties. And this really was as a result of the terror that had been engendered by the gas attacks during the First World War, which you remember was only 20 years prior to this. So while these images here are from the First World War, that's what people were thinking of, and uh, the government, of course, as well. This later um, image is just showing the main kinds of poison gas that were used and the impact that they had. So it's totally understandable why people were so terrified of them. But while the gas masks were issued, uh, the really Dublin had virtually no active defences and had bomb shelter accommodation for fewer than 30,000 people. 
you can see one of the air raid shelters here in the middle of O'Connell Street. This is in 1944. Um, and uh, while many of the measures were being copied from the British example, they weren't really copying them in terms of the structure because, as you can see, a lot of this is actually overground, which was probably not the best protection for bombs falling from the sky. And we didn't have very many of the um, Anderson shelters and others that were built in uh, Northern Ireland, for instance, though there were, of course, some, uh, but mainly installed by people themselves if they had a garden. Here's one of the gas, gas masks, which are kind of horrifying to look at, but better than breathing in what was expected. But the um, equipment or the general sort of, as we know now would call them PPE, uh, you can see I'm not sure how effective it would be if you had maybe the gas got on a cut or something on your exposed hand. But uh, as I said, it didn't actually arise. The picture here is the interior of a Dublin air raid shelter uh, being dug out. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't find any other illustrations to know quite whether this is on uh, a ground level or deeper underground. But uh, one of the major problems about the air raid shelters, apart from uh, their absence to the great extent, was that quite often they were locked, particularly in the city. Uh, and allegedly this was because the male citizens of Dublin were using them as toilets. Now, most of the measures that were adopted by the Irish government under the Emergency Powers Act, as I said, were a copy of those for Britain, but they mainly were the administrative ones in nature, uh, primarily concerned with the maintenance of law and order. The most uh, widespread precaution against bombing raids was the imposition of a blackout during hours of darkness. The blackout was regulated by the Emergency Powers Control of Lights Order in 1939, which was passed by the Doyle on the 16th of October that year. However, the directions about the blackout were fairly unclear, resulting in what happened to be a patchwork of lights around most parts of Dublin. The letters pages of the newspapers at that time reflect the debate that was going on about the wisdom of having a blackout at all. Some people argued that a neutral country should not be blocked out so that an aircraft could identify the difference between ERA and Northern Ireland, because of course Northern Ireland was a belligerent state being part of the United Kingdom, so they were very strongly blacked out where there was confusion about it in the south. Before the North Strand bombing, there were previous incidents of German bombs being dropped on the south, most of which have been dismissed as pilot error, although various rumours suggested there might have been more sinister motives, but none of these were completely substantiated. On the 26th of August 1940, three women lost their lives when a bomb struck Camp Hall Creamery in County Wexford. The German government subsequently apologised and offered £9,000 in compensation to their families. A few months later, in January 1941, another three women were killed when a bomb struck their farmhouse in Nockro, County Carlo. A bomb was also dropped in Terra in uh, on the 2nd of January 1941, thankfully with no fatalities this time, and it was followed by a second one the next day on Denor Terrace off the South Circular Road. There were other incidents in Louth, Kildare, Wexford and Wicklow, significantly all on the eastern seaboard, over which German planes would have flown if heading for Northern Ireland, and they are generally accepted to have been due to pilot error. The theory about the Dublin bombs on 31st of May is more complex and frequently attributes the moral blame to Britain, albeit recognising that the actual weapons were German. 
Winston Churchill claimed after the war that the Royal Air Force had interfered with the radar beams which the German pilots used to navigate at night. So the pilot who dropped the 500 pound landmine on North Strand probably thought he was flying over Belfast or one of the English cities closer to the Irish Sea. However, Churchill was no friend of air and put a lot of effort in trying to undermine our neutrality. So his account is not that reliable because it was intended to really put the blame on the Irish government. So if you listen to the RTE History Show segment on the North Strand Bombing website, you can hear an extract from a very English sounding Pathé newsreel broadcast and um, the broadcaster saying that maybe the bombing is the price era has to pay for sitting on the fence and sounding rather disgracefully gleeful about the prospect. So Catherine will be dealing with or detailing some of the tragic stories that emerged after the bombs landed on the night of 30th into 31st of May 1941. Apart from the deaths and injuries, there was significant trauma arising from the destruction of people's homes and businesses. As I mentioned earlier, there was pressure on housing and overcrowding throughout the area. Although the shock of losing all or even some of one's possessions would have been dreadful, regardless of the size of a home. In Dublin, slum clearance had already been well underway and uh, when the emergency started, but the shortage of raw materials for construction was to bring the programme to a virtual standstill in mid-1941. North Strand, Ballybock and Summerhill were tight-knit communities and neighbours would usually have come to the aid of other neighbours in need, but the devastation was so extensive that assistance was needed from all over the city. Dublin Corporation officials mobilised to provide new housing for those made homeless. Uh, but the dispossessed needed more than just a roof over their heads. The Irish Red Cross provided uh, emergency shelter at the mansion house and in parish halls throughout the city. The city manager decreed that uh, damaged houses should be repaired where possible. And these made, those made homeless by the bombing were to be relocated to Dublin Corporation's new housing estates at Cabra and Crumlin. However, the new houses were still to be completed and the progress on refurbishing the damaged homes um, was very slow. So there were many people still being housed in emergency accommodation months after the destruction had happened. Uh, the delays were causing such distress and so many complaints being made to the government that Sean Moylan, who was the parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Defence, walked down to the bomb sites to see for himself what was happening. He wrote an angry letter to PJ Herman, the city manager, pointing out that public morale would be damaged by the failure of the corporation to act swiftly. Compensation was provided, um, and uh, but really only to the owners of damaged property, or and this was under the terms of the Neutrality War Damage to Property Act 1941 which was passed by the door in September. So even then people had been left for some time without being able to claim uh, recompense for the damage done to them. Um, you can see that the act was to make provision for the payment of compensation out of public monies to persons who on or after the 26th day of August 1940 suffer injury to their property in the state or the territorial waters thereof as a consequence of an act of the armed forces of an external government or authority engaged in a war in respect of which the state is neutral. 
or as a consequence of an accidental occurrence arising from something done outside the state by any such armed force and to make provision for matters connected with such injuries to property or the payment of compensation therefore. Now, as you go down through the various regulations and the uh, terms of the Act, it is quite clear that it didn't apply to people like uh, tenement um, dwellers who were paying rent to a landlord rather than being able to claim for their own, uh, their own property as owners. Dublin Corporation did acquire two areas where the bomb damage was most severe one off the Summerhill Parade and one off the North Strand for the purpose of clearing the districts and developing a new housing scheme. Clothes, precious family possessions and food were destroyed even when people escaped injury or death. And in some cases, victims lost their livelihood as businesses were demolished. Calls for donations were made through the city's press and many people did respond generously. Fundraising events were held, but there are many accounts of tenement dwellers who were left destitute. They didn't have much in the first place and the compensation terms, as I said, mainly excluded them. Dublin Corporation commissioned photographer Henry, Mc Henry McRae of 152 Clontarf Road to record the destruction for insurance and assessment purposes. He began work on the 4th of June 1941 and continued until the end of October that year. McRae's 57 photographs can be seen in full as part of the online exhibition and Catherine and I are showing some of them this evening. While we know that the worst damage was inflicted on the North Strand itself, uh, on the North Circular Road and on Clarence Street North, you see some children here sitting on the remains. Um, basically, uh, it was decades before all the bomb sites had been cleared and new buildings erected on them. Um, in the short video on the exhibition site, you can see some of the destruction as it was back in the 1940s, side by side with pictures of the sites as they are now. Um, this is another uh, McRae photograph of North Clarence Street. Um, and another one of Quinn's Cottages. And here you can see how if a, bill, uh, a bomb fell, it could literally cut buildings in half. And Catherine will tell some of those stories. Charleville Cottages, quite near the uh, library, which was incredibly untouched by uh, bomb damage, although it was so close to the epicenter. So uh, Summer Hill Parade and uh, you can see people continuing on as much as they could with their daily lives, but obviously it wasn't an easy thing to do. And Empress Place, which of course is gone now anyway, um, but the damage to what was a fairly heavily tenanted building. So I am going to hand you over now to Catherine as she presents some of the moving testimonies from the website. Thank you for listening and uh, it is something that is very difficult to remember even 80 years on. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, so I'll be looking at the oral histories collected during the North Strand Oral History Project by Dublin City Archives, mostly in 2009 and 2010. These oral histories or these memories of people who experienced the bombing and its devastating effects firsthand add to the documented history we have of the time and they often catch the personal experience or anecdotes that otherwise wouldn't have been collected and record the impact the event had on the community of the North Strand. And one of those interviewed was Michael Carrick. And Michael would have been 10 years old in 1941 when the bombing occurred. Uh, he was living in a tenement house at 155 North Strand with his two older brothers, Seamus and Philip, his mother and his aunt. They had a whole floor, so they had a kitchen and a parlor in the front room and then a bedroom in the back room. 
And on the night of the 31st, Michael recalls waking up in the back room to his brothers looking out the window at the searchlights in the sky and hearing the anti-aircraft guns. But he himself was too nervous to look out the window. Um, his mother instructed them all to get back into bed, quote, we were hardly back in bed when I didn't hear a bang, but a shudder. The whole house shook, everything shook. At 2.05 a.m., a 500 pound bomb had been dropped between the tram tracks on the North Strand. They hadn't had gas installed in the house for long, but after the bomb, the smell of gas was absolutely overpowering. Michael describes, quote, the whole front of the house had been cut like as with a knife. Everything was gone just like that. Everything in our front room, everything we had that was in any way decent, end quote. And just a few weeks before, Michael's mother had actually moved the boys into the front room. And for some reason, she changed her mind and brought them back into the back room, which saved their lives in the end. Um, Michael and his family walked down the stairs of their house and where they should have seen a big, long hallway, there was nothing. They could see directly out onto the street. Volunteers helped them across the debris and you can see the type of destruction that would have been around them in the photo on screen. Um, Michael was covered in blood and so a doctor came over, was brought over to examine him, quickly realised that Michael was actually fine. Uh, the blood wasn't his own but his aunt's. Uh, she had been cut by a lump of plaster as it fell from the ceiling but thankfully she was also fine. Um, the family then went to William Street Convent where they sat eating soup in a big classroom with all of their neighbours and this is where they started hearing stories about what had happened and how many people were killed and very sadly Michael's neighbours who lived in the basement below them and um, John and Mary Farin did not survive and a few days later on June 5th Michael celebrated his 11th birthday in the Irish Red Cross, Cross headquarters in Mespel Road with cake and a bottle of lemonade describing it as quote one of the best birthdays I had, I suppose, to be alive and all that. So eventually the family got a house in Cabra West and a salvaged bed and table and chairs from their destroyed home were brought to the house by a Dublin Corporation car. His older brother would describe them as, quote, refugees in their own country. And as Michael had a lot of friends still in the North Strand, he did go back and visit, but he described how it had changed, quote, it's not the same, you can never go back. It brings back memories. It doesn't bring back the people that was there at the time under the same conditions. And at the end of the interview, Michael said that he was delighted that he got someone to listen to him and have the story on record. And this comes up again and again at the end of the interviews when you read them, that people are just happy that they're getting to share the story, that it's going to be in the archive forever. They want this, the major event of the bombing, but also the experience of growing up in the North Strand and living in the North Strand and the community there to be on record. And of the 28 people who sadly lost their lives in the North Strand bombing, seven of those were from the same family. Uh, the Brown family were originally from Edenderry, County Offaly, and included Harry Brown, his wife, Marlene Corrigan, their children, Maureen, who was seven, Anne, five, Edward, three, and baby Angela, and also Harry's mother, Mary. The only surviving memory of, or member of the Brown family was Harry's sister, Minnie, who lived not far away in a house with her family in Clontarf. It is her descendants who survived to tell the Brown family story to the archives. So that's Thelma, Minnie's daughter, so Harry Brown's niece, and Sean, Minnie's son-in-law. And in 1935, Harry's parents, Edward and Mary, moved to Dublin for work and they found a home in the North Strand. So two years later, in 1937, Harry and his family joined them as Harry found a good job as a coach builder in the bus department of the Great Southern Railway. The family moved into a flat uh, over Nally's shop at number 25 North Strand. His, Mary, uh, his mother Mary later moved in with them in 1939 when she was widowed. And according to accounts, they were settled and happy in the area. Harry was a member of the local defence force. So when reports of the first four bombs dropped, that night reached him, he rushed to Summerhill to help with rescue efforts. Um, a German plane was circling over the north of the city, evading the searchlights and anti-aircraft guns. Um, so Harry Brown, worried for his family, rushed home, but it was, he made it to the front door, but it was too late. Uh, his body was found within the rubble by rescue workers with the doorknob still in his hand. Sadly, his entire family, his mother, 
wife and four young children had perished inside. According to Thelma, her father, who had to identify the Brown family at the coroner's inquest, told her that, quote, there was no more to identify, end quote, and Angela, the baby of the family, had never been found. But realising they needed closer, closure, she was confirmed dead. Um, after the inquest, their bodies were transported home to Eden Derry for the funeral. The town was in shock that a young family who had only left the area a few years ago were returning in coffins. Mary Brown, the grandmother of the family, had been due to move back to Eden Derry the following week. Um, and after a funeral mass, they were buried together at Drumcooley graveyard. Thelma describes the effect the tragedy of losing her family had on her mother for her entire life. Quote, everybody belonged to her was gone. Minnie and her family didn't live in Clontarf long after the bombings. First, they moved back to Eden Derry and then to England. So while many residents didn't want to leave the North Strand and their communities, for Minnie and her family, quote, there were too many stark memories around the North Strand for them to stay there, that they would be passing through it every day and the buildings that were all flattened. And it was after sharing the story that Sean said he hoped it wasn't too late, uh, as many of the people who would have known the Browns were already passed on, like his father-in-law. Um, but he said, quote, I love the way he put this, he said, quote, it is better to have something than not to record it at all, as long as they are not forgotten. Change my okay. um, so it wasn't just as Mary mentioned lives that were lost that day, homes and businesses were also destroyed. Um, Brendan, Vincent, and Maura Roach spoke about their family barber shop, which was destroyed by the bomb. The barber shop was located at 34 North Strand Road and had originally belonged to their grandfather, who lived at 54 North Strand Road until his death in 1937. And Brendan and Vincent remember living in the basement under the barber shop before they moved out to Kimmage in 1934. So in the photo on screen, uh, you can just about see the barbers behind the tree in between the chemists and Roddy's shop. On the night of the 31st, the boys, who would have been about 13, 13 and 9, uh, remember watching the searchlights in the sky. They remember vividly that although the sash windows of their home in Kimmage always rattled, quote, they really rattled that night. But the first they knew of the bomb was their uncle Desi arriving at their house in the early morning, shortly after the bomb had dropped, shouting for their father to come quick because the house on the North Strand was on fire. Their father got on his bike and cycled to the North Strand. He was extremely concerned about two women who he had working there uh, in the ladies' salon as they lived in the North Strand. He was very relieved as he cycled up Fairview that he saw the two of them walking home. They had been at a dance in the Metropole Hotel that night on O'Connell Street. The window of their shop had been blown in and the shop itself was completely destroyed. This put the family in a very difficult place financially. They had a mortgage on a house in Kimmage with four children and a fifth on the way. The Roaches don't remember their father getting a lot of financial help, bar some money from the Red Cross at Christmas, and later they got £1,100 compensation from the German government. They were able to salvage some marble slabs, chrome and brushes from the store in the North Strand, which they reused when the family opened a barbershop in Kimmage on a shoestring budget in about 1942. This is just another angle uh, of the street with the shop just at the very edge of the photo, so you can really see the destruction of the area. On Saturday morning after the bomb, Brendan was put on the crossbars of his dad's bike and brought to the North Strand. He clearly remembers the large hole in the ground left by the bomb and thinking, quote, God, you'd fit a bus in that. As a child, it appeared huge to him. And often it's the funny or out of place elements that we remember the most. So when Vincent was brought into the North Strand on Sunday, he laughs as he remembers that opposite the shop in the apartments that had been badly damaged by the bomb, he saw a dresser stuck on a wall with no floor underneath it to hold it up and that it was just sitting there looking terribly strange and how all the jam jars in the shelf, uh, on the shelf of the grocers next door to the barber shop, the glass had smashed so the jam was running down the shelves. For years, well into the 1960s, whenever they passed the North Strand, their dad would point out the tiles that were still there on the doorstep of what had been the family barber shop and proudly say, look at those tiles, that's where my shop was. 
So Alfreda O'Brien tells the story of her dad, Francis O'Brien Jr., uh, her aunt Marie and her grandparents, Mar Mary and Francis Sr. On the night of the 31st, her aunt Marie charged into her brother Francis's room, flung him from the bed and pulled the bed upside down on top of them. Confused, Francis thought his sister was trying to kill him, but she probably saved his life as the walls caved in around them. Francis Sr., Alfreda's grandfather, had been a petty officer in the Royal Navy and had experience as a medic in the First World War. So he went straight into action, organising the other St. John's Ambulance volunteers that lived around the North Strand. And these photos, Alfreda kindly donated to the archive, show the St. John's Ambulance Brigade at a gas mask training day and also the type of ambulance that they would have been driving around the North Strand. Rescue services from all over Dublin gathered in the North Strand as quickly as possible, including the Fire Brigade, Gardaí, Soldiers, Red Cross, and as mentioned, St. John's Ambulance. In the Evening Herald, published Saturday, May 31st, the Assistant Commissioner of St. John's, J.T. McNamara, paid tribute to the work of the volunteers who worked in, quote, complete coordination and cooperation. Later in the Irish Independent on June 2nd, uh, it was reported that the Air Raid Precaution Services had searched the debris for bodies and for their victims, while the Red Cross and ambulance services found accommodation for and fed those who had become homeless. Younger boys, like Alfreda's father, Francis, who was about 10 at the time, were set up as running messengers, running from Clonliffe, where there was a phone, and into the city centre. And gas at the time was rationed during the war, and Francis Sr. was a gas company inspector, also known as a glimmerman, whose job was to catch anyone who used extra gas, which, as you can imagine, was not a particularly well-liked role in the North Strand or any other area. And so if the glimmer man was spotted in the area, the word would go around to all the neighbours that he was near, uh, so he would have time to turn off the gas. And Francis Sr. was locally nicknamed the Galloper because he was so quick to move from one house to the other. Many of the people interviewed mentioned how they would always have a cold, wet rag beside them when they were cooking. So if the glimmerman called around, you could put the flame out and cool down the gas pipes so the glimmerman would be none the wiser. But Francis's knowledge of gas lines came in extremely handy that night. The bomb site was an incredibly dangerous place for the victims and the rescue workers, as they were surrounded by live wires, uh, tram cables, and escaping gas. Gas clouds can be highly explosive, and they're also not. So there were small fires appearing air in the area, and the danger was growing. As the firefighters tried to tame the flames, uh, volunteers searched for the gas leak. The bomb had blown up the huge 12-inch gas main. Thinking quickly, Francis O'Brien put a match to the gas leak, which created an ordinary flame to burn the gas coming out and save the area of a further explosion. Like many others, in the aftermath of the bombing, Alfreda's family was moved to Cabra. Her grandmother Mary loved the house as she had a proper garden or a proper kitchen and her quote good room and for the first time she could plant flowers as she had a front garden. She cried going back to the North Strand but her husband Francis was extremely keen to move back to the place that he loved, had lived all his life and where all his family were. Quote, when he was in Cabra he felt cut off and so it was really important for him to move back. And their kids were also very happy to be back in the North Strand with all their friends. Alfreda describes how the spirit of the people of the North Strand stayed with their father forever. Quote, the amazing thing about people, they rallied together, they always seemed to know what to do to help their neighbour. The last person I'm going to talk about is Betty Kyo. Betty was five years old and living with her mother Dora, father Jack and eight-year-old brother Noel. They rented one room from a family in number 10, Charvel Mall. On the night of the 31st, Betty woke up to the screams and cries of her mother and the sound of explosions. Her father ran outside to try and find out what was happening. And after he'd been gone a while, her mother went out to look for him. But before she left, she put Betty and her brother in a bed that faced the back wall of the house with the son of the family they lodged with. Betty didn't really understand what was happening, but all of a sudden, quote, the entire back wall of the house completely collapsed and disappeared. The memory of this is clear in Betty's mind and she says, quote, sometimes I don't remember what happened this morning, but I can remember that as if it happened last night. Noel, her brother, remembers their older neighbour taking them down the stairs that were covered in broken glass. They were taken to an air raid shelter in the basement of either the church or Charbomal Library. 
In the shelter, they were surrounded by scared women crying or saying the rosary and other children who were running around in their pajamas, not really understanding what was going on and some of them thinking it was a bit of fun, a bit of a game. They were later brought to the convent across the road, the Irish Sisters of Charity, and given tea and bread by the nuns. Every single thing her family owned was destroyed by the bomb. Despite losing, quote, absolutely everything, there wasn't a stick of furniture or anything to wear. All we had left was what we were wearing. The family only received 18 pounds in compensation. Relations helped them with clothing and personal items. They moved in with her aunt and uncle in East Wall, which would have been a squeeze as they, that family already had eight children. Uh, her father joined the British army almost immediately and was sent to Southeast Asia and then Germany, not returning for eight years. Betty stayed in and grew up in the North Strand, as when her mother was offered a house in Cabra, she returned it down and said, because she thought of Cabra as the countryside. They rented a room again on the North Strand before moving to Amien Street. And this came up again and again in the interviews. People didn't want to leave the North Strand or the community they had there. So Betty remembers the North Strand in the aftermath of the bombing. She remembers, quote, a lovely cake shop right at the Five Lamps and Burns Grocery Shop. That a big space was still empty after the bombing. All the buildings that were destroyed were just left like that for years. The whole North Strand was just full of rubble for years. And as kids, they would play in the wreckage, using the broken bricks around them to play house. When the rubble was cleared, they would make slides in the winter as it was all flat. Quote, all the boys played with all the girls. We all played together and we kind of looked out for each other. And there are so many stories and anecdotes about the night of the bombing, but also life in general in the North Strand during the emergency and beyond. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through them all, but if you are interested in reading more or listening to the people themselves tell their story, uh, they are all available on the website northstrandbombing.ie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you, Catherine. That was a fascinating recreation of the events surrounding uh, the bombing of the North Strand. The combination of background material and the political, economic and social context with the contemporary photographs of the devastation and the personal stories from survivors has given us an understanding of a tragic event in May 1941, which has shaped lives and communities ever since. Again, thank you both.